from God's Word is topical. That is, my message is zeroed in on a single issue, the importance of children. Not children in mass, but each child as an individual. But I'm persuaded as my message unfolds that most of you will agree with me that each child is important for entirely different reasons than most people will admit. I'd like to begin by establishing two realities that are very important to thinking right thoughts and doing right deeds. First, there is the truthfulness and utility of the Bible. By truthfulness, I refer to the factual accuracy and historical reliability of the Bible in every respect. The Bible is wrong about nothing. The Bible is right about everything. And though this sermon is not about the accuracy and reliability of the Bible, it is based upon the accuracy and reliability of the Bible. To you or to anyone you know who challenges the accuracy and reliability of the Bible, I make a single claim. You are wrong. You are just wrong. God's word is forever settled in heaven and its truthfulness reflects the character of its author the creator and sustainer of all things. Regarding the Bible's utility, I will assert without attempting to prove that living one's life according to the guidance of the Bible is the simplest and most practical approach to living. Life is so complicated that the variables that add complexity to our lives are so many that greater wisdom is needed to successfully negotiate life in this world than any individual possesses. Boy, you have to be arrogant to think you can make it through life without the roadmap of the Bible. For that reason, as well as other reasons, I, I will not presently go into this morning, the Bible-guided lifestyle, be it the individual's life, be it the married couple's life or the parent's family life is without doubt the most practical lifestyle that can be lived. The second reality is related to the first without being exactly the same. It has to do with the difference between subjectivity and objectivity. As I will use the word, subjective has to do, has to do with your opinion. Subjective has to do with your feelings and with your conclusions drawn about matters. To illustrate, subjective speaks to your opinion about the relative merits of Coca-Cola versus Dr. Pepper. Some people are Coke guys, some people are Dr. Pepper guys. Uh, the relative merits of the Dodgers versus the Angels. Some guys will come to blows arguing it, but it's really a subjective opinion in the end. And that might be that different opinions from, diff from different people are expressed in different ways and drawn different conclusions, and that's all well and good. Objective hand has to do with reality over opinion has to do with position rather than disposition, has to do with fact instead of feeling. I might even quote that, uh, that, that, uh, that scholar of Judaism, Ben Shapiro, who says, facts don't care about your feelings. And he's absolutely right. He's right about that if he's wrong about a number of other things. It is objectively true that 2 plus 3 equals 5. And it is objectively true that 9 minus 7 equals 2, regardless of anyone's subjective opinion about arithmetic. Now, what do these two realities have to do with the importance of children? They have very much to do with the importance of children. Follow along with my line of thought. Most people who think children are important think they are important because children are important to them. But this is entirely 
false reasoning because it is merely subjective. How so? An unborn baby girl is thought by many people in India, China, and the United States of America to be unimportant because of so many pregnancies of women with girls being terminated by abortions for no other reason than the sex of the unborn baby. Mom gets pregnant, finds out that uh, her pregnancy is with a girl. We don't want a girl. Bang, kill the girl. Thus, millions of unborn baby girls are treated as though they are of no importance because they are of no importance to the mother carrying them in that they are killed before they are born. Their reasoning is subjective opinion and deadly to unborn baby girls. But it is not just unborn baby girls who are thought by so many people in India, China, and the United States to be unimportant. <clears throat> so many abortions are performed each year to terminate the lives of unborn boys as well. Thus, while unborn baby boys are somewhat more favored by their mothers than are unborn baby girls, the death toll by abortions for both unborn girls and unborn boys numbers in the millions. Thus, to a slightly different degree, subjective opinion is also deadly to many unborn baby boys. Therefore, if the measure of a child's worth is the sentence child by the mother, subjective opinion, then a child's value is determined by what many people would identify as an accident or coincidence. Is a child's worth really only a reflection of a mother's sentiment toward her child? Think about it with me. What if the mother dies? Does the child suddenly lose value because the one person in the world who valued the child passes off the scene? That doesn't sit very well with us, does it? Reflect now with me about the importance of a child to the father. Is a child important only if the child is subjectively important to the father? If that is the case, what about the children conceived as a consequence of a violent act of rape? The fathers of such children obviously have no concern for their offspring. Are their children therefore without value? Without importance? As well, what about the child whose father was married and, and whose mother gave birth to the child, but then the father leaves, as so many fathers do, never to be seen or heard from again? Is the child who is left behind an individual who was important but is now no longer important because the father no longer treats the child as important? Don't you see the error of such thinking? Imagining that your child is important only if your child is important to you is not objective thinking. It is subjective thinking. It is life lived in such a way that only your opinion matters. It is also the basis for the abortion industry and their insistence that unborn children are not important and are not to be treated as important if they are not important to their mothers. But how can that be? How can that be? If children are only important if they are important to their mothers or if they are important to their fathers, then what happens when mom is gone? Or if dad is gone, do children lose their importance? Or what about the child who concludes in his own mind that he is unimportant? If I think I am unimportant, then it is likely I may therefore conclude that it doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what I feel, and it doesn't matter what I do. You think maybe the prisons are full of men who think like that? It makes no difference if I commit crimes. It makes no difference if I live a life of cheating and stealing or even commit suicide because I'm not important. 
Consider the two little boys who have been beaten to death in the last two years here in Southern California. The news media has been all over it. Would their mother's boyfriends have done what they did to little boys they considered to be important? Would their mothers have even allowed boyfriends into their homes if they considered their sons to be important enough to protect from predators? Tells you something about a woman who will allow her child to be in the company of a man she doesn't really know. Do not think violence is required to prove my point. I know kids who are ignored because they are considered unimportant by their moms or their dads. No violence, just no attention, no care, and no love. I hope I've made the case to show how risky it is for children for their importance and value to be based solely on the opinions their mothers have about them or the opinions their fathers have about them. I maintain children are important, moms and dads. I maintain each child is important. But their importance has nothing to do with how much you like them. Their importance has nothing to do with how much you love them. It has nothing to do with how important you think they are. Their importance is not a subjective opinion. It is an objective reality based upon the truthfulness and the reliability of the Bible, God's Word. I set before you four things to consider regarding your child's importance as a motivating and guiding factor for how you should raise your child. First, every child is important because every child possesses an eternal and undying soul. Regardless of the sex of your child, the presence or absence of a chromosome the native intelligence of your child, or the athletic potential of your child, there is possessed by every child something identified as a soul. My own opinion is that sex, chromosomal patterns, intelligence, skin color, athletic ability, overall general health, and whatever else is visible and measurable in the life of any individual is a feature of each person's physical existence and has no bearing on the importance of one's soul throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 reveals that man became a living soul when God created him. And if you search the Bible throughout, you will discover that it is one soul that is the true seat of identity, the portion of you and every other person that is truly immortal, and that your appearance, your abilities, your intelligence, and other physical aspects of your existence are so very temporary. Young person, you are important. Not because you have a soul, but because you are a soul. Moms and dads, children are not important because they are your kids, but because they are living souls. And because they are living souls, your parenting and the choices you make as a mom and a dad should reflect what the Bible says about their spiritual, eternal needs. Next, Every child is valuable because every child bears the image of God. Perhaps you are unmoved by someone who desecrates a nation's flag by setting it on fire in front of a congresswoman's office or, and traipsing all over it or, or, or some such thing as that. But, but take note of what happens to anyone who does that in Russia. Take note of what happens to anyone who does that in China. Take note of what happens to anyone that does that in India or in Brazil or in Argentina. The fact is, a nation's flag represents the nation, the people. It is a symbol. By desecrating a nation's flag, you instigate an assault 
an insult against the nation the flag represents. Do that in Mexico. Do that in Colombia. Do that in Egypt. Do that in Turkey. Or do that in Russia. And see what happens to you when you do. Consider also the communion of the Lord's Supper. Especially the Apostle Paul's declaration to the Corinthian congregation that some of their church's members were sick and some even died because of their misconduct while observing that ordinance. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 29 and 30. You ask why so? The communion of the Lord's Supper represents the Lord's body, according to the Apostle. It was a symbol of... And disrespecting the symbol resulted in a reaction from God in somewhat similar fashion. Every human being, which would obviously include every child, bears the image of God. It was God's design to in some way imprint his image unto each human being, beginning with Adam, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. He accomplished his goal, Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So we ask, what is the image of God? Honest theologians and Bible scholars will admit that we don't really know for sure, but it is some kind of spiritual imprint of God on a person. And the result is that bearing the image of God, even bearing the marred image of God as a sinner, imparts to every human being astonishing value. So much so that the criminal taking of any human life, because each of us bears God's image, is a capital crime punishable by death. Genesis chapter 9, verse 6. Whoso sheddeth man's blood... By, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. Consider a human being, especially a child, important because he or she is an eternal soul and additionally valuable because each and every child bears the mark of God, bears the image of God. That separates every child from pets. That separates every child from dogs. That separates every child from cats. That separates every child from birds. That separates every child from fish. Even your beloved goldfish. That also makes every child infinitely valuable. With that value being reflected in how parents should raise their own children and how every adult ought to treat anyone's child. The question is, is such reflected in your life choices? Third, every child, every child is a recipient of God's grace. <clears throat> Though there is disagreement among theologians and Bible teachers about the extent to which God blesses every human being with grace, undeserved favor and blessings, that's what grace is, there is no doubt among theologians and Bible teachers that God does indeed bless every human being in some way without exception. That makes every human being the object of God's favor. That makes every human being in some way and to some degree a recipient of God's grace. To be sure, God's grace in each person's life varies. However, no person is utterly without some measure of God's grace. How do we know? Consider John chapter 1, verse 16, where we are told by the apostle about the Lord Jesus Christ, and of his fullness have we all received, and grace for grace... Now, this verse does not in any way suggest that every sinner's sins are forgiven because of Christ. We are clearly shown in Scripture that all who die without faith in Christ will suffer the eternal torment of the damned. However, this verse does show that in some way every human being has received some measure of God's grace, blessing, if you will, because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Next, we turn to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, where the Apostle Paul writes, <clears throat> Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, 
that it may minister grace unto the hearers. It can never be said that any individual is without, in some, without some measure of God's grace so long as a believer in Jesus Christ is nearby and willing to speak words of kindness, encouragement, and gospel witness to that person. Thus, there is no one utterly without God's grace if any believer in Jesus Christ has anything to say about it. That means such a person is favored in some way by God. Third, we look at our Lord's own words in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 45. He said, <clears throat> that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. If you look at the verse that precedes this one, you see that this verse provides part of the reason why each of us should love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them that which despitefully use you and persecute you. It is in part because even your enemy, as well as that person who curses you and hates you, that person is the object of some measure of God's favor, God's grace. You say, well, how do we know? The sun shines on them as well as on you, does it not? As well, he benefits just as much from God's reign as you do. That means he receives what some call common grace, what others call prevenient grace, whatever the label, it is God's grace and is an indication of some amount of God's favor. Don't ignore that. It would be foolish to ignore that. <clears throat> While even despicable people are the recipients of some measure of God's grace, qualifying every child as thereby being important, recognize that some children, some children will someday become believers in Jesus Christ, thereby becoming God's children. <clears throat> how do you know how a child will turn out in life? Do you, do you know God's plan and purpose for each individual child and, and how greatly favored a young child may be shown to be in later life? You don't know that. I don't know that. Do you have any idea how many minds were blown by people who discovered that I had become a Christian? Him? Are you kidding me? Could you have predicted that little boy born in China would grow up and emigrate to the United States and become the first PhD granted by the Ohio State University to an Asian? More importantly, could you have predicted God's hand on John Sung's life, returning to his homeland to become the greatest of the evangelists in China before World War II? No one could have predicted that. Then there is Mary Slessor. Just an ordinary Scottish girl born in 1848 in Aberdeen. Who could have known the impact she would have as a Christian missionary in Nigeria by the time she died in 1915, yet so many came to know Christ through her ministry and thousands of Nigerian children were saved from being murdered by her efforts. The point that I seek to make here is that every child is important. Because every child is a recipient of God's grace, showing God's favor in some way, with some children later shown to be the objects of God's great favor. How so? They come to know Jesus Christ in response to the gospel presented to them, <clears throat> and some of them are then most wonderfully used by God. Every child is important. <clears throat> every child has an eternal soul. Every child bears the image of God, and every child receives some measure of God's grace. So how can you tell which child will become a recipient of great measures of God's unmerited favor as those who trust Christ as their personal Savior? How can you tell? You cannot tell. But God has known since before time began. Ponder the school teacher in Nepal who slapped the face 
of the low caste seven-year-old little boy who dared to walk to the front of the classroom thinking of him as only an undeserved low-born wretch. Get to the back of the class, you dog. I wonder at the teacher's reaction upon learning that the little boy grew up to command 10,000 guerrilla fighters, each of them armed with an AK-47. Do you think that teacher trembled at the thought of that Maoist commander possibly coming back to exact retribution from him? However, more important is God's reaction to the assault on his future anointed church planter, evangelist, and pastor known to us as Samuel Rye. Romans chapter 12, verse 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto the wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. That teacher had nothing to fear from Samuel Rye, even if he had gone back. That teacher had better fear God. Treat every child well. Recognize that every child is important. Understand that some of those children will be numbered among God's choicest servants. How does that affect your treatment of children, especially the treatment of your own child? Finally, reflect an awareness of Christ's concern. For children, as evidenced by first his comments about children, having been born of the Virgin Mary and having grown up in the household of Joseph and Mary, there is nothing about childhood the Lord Jesus Christ was not familiar with other than the experience of personal sin. Therefore, he knew not only the spiritual danger involved with childhood, but the effect on children of neglectful adults, however well-intentioned they might be. Most famous of his comments regarding children is likely either of these two statements. First, the rebuke he uttered in Mark chapter 10, verse 14. Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. I, I say rebuke because of the context of his comment made not to parents, but made to his own disciples for being obstacles who impeded children's access to him. That means ushers, Sunday school teachers, church workers, anybody involved in ministry to children, you better watch out that you don't get in the way. Amen? You better not get in the way. The Lord Jesus Christ knew how important it was for even the youngest among us to have access to him, that they might learn of him, and that they might, in, that they might be encouraged to come to him for salvation full and free. Next, the warning he spoke in Matthew chapter 18, verse 6, after calling a child alongside. Imagine the Lord Jesus Christ sitting there on the ground and beckoning to a child, and come here, come here. And the, and the little boy or the little girl comes and stands next to him, and then he says, But whoso shall offend one of these little ones who believe in me? That lets us know that little children can believe in him. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. And also his provision for children. It is right in light of the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ is clearly shown to be the creator and sustainer of all things to ask of his provision for children. It was the Lord Jesus Christ, you see, who designed the scheme of biological reproduction by which children are conceived and born into the world. That was his idea. And it was the Lord Jesus Christ who served as the architect for the family unit in which children were to be born and raised in preparation, not only for adulthood, but also for eternity. But beyond a family and parents in this life, the Lord Jesus Christ provided the ground for salvation the new birth, the forgiveness of sins, justification by faith, and adoption into the family of God as preparation for the next life. For what purpose did the Savior create 
the ministry of fatherhood. That's something every dad needs to think about. For what purpose did he create my ministry as a dad? To what end did the Savior create the ministry of motherhood? So that fathers and mothers could raise their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord to the end that each child might in this lifetime be prepared for eternity in the next. 2,000 years ago, the eternal Son of the living God left heaven's glory to enter the human race as the virgin-born Son of God, born of a maid named Mary in a village named Bethlehem. He lived a sinless life and died a sacrificial death on the cross of Calvary, but that's not the end of it. <clears throat> Three days after he died, he rose from the dead as he had predicted in glorious victory over sin, death, hell, and the grave showing himself alive to hundreds with many infallible proofs, he then returned to glory where he has since then been enthroned at God the Father's right hand. And someday he will return in power and in great glory. But until he returns, his command, because he doesn't ask, he doesn't ask. He only asks questions of people to engage them in dialogue. When he wants something from someone, he doesn't ask them to do it. He commands them to do it. Why? Because he's God. Because he's the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He doesn't ask, will you please consider doing this for me? No. He says, do this. Do this. And the wise among us hear and obey. His purpose, his plan, and his desire is for men, women, and children to come under the sound of the gospel being preached, to come to the realization of personal guilt and sinfulness, and to trust Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and to receive the gift of God, which is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. These things rehearsed has it been established to your satisfaction that children are important? That each and every child is important. Important to God and therefore certainly important to you. Not because you love the child, but because the child is a soul. Because the child bears God's image. Because the child receives God's grace, which is God's unmerited favor, and because of Christ's concern for the child. Should the child's importance affect how you relate to the child? How you raise the child as a mom or a dad? Duh, it should. Amen? It better. Children are important not only because they're important to you, but because they're important to God, because they are eternal beings, and because they are properly to be prepared for eternity according to God's plan. Our reason for Vacation Bible School, for our children's ministry, and for the ministry of the Word to parents, parents-to-be and grandparents is to urge children to consider the claims of Christ so they might be prepared for eternity and to equip adults to properly raise children. Crucial to that, of course, is your own relationship with Jesus Christ. Therefore, if you are not a Christian, you need to be. Let's stand, shall we, with our heads bowed and eyes closed for just a moment.